So I started, started working with David in 1986 um, to develop the uh, New South Wales State Reference Laboratory for HIV. At that time, the lab was in an abandoned operating theatre in the basement of the hospital, kind of a pretty depressing kind of uh, surroundings. The clinic was in the corridor that led up to the, to the, uh, to the lab, and our office was in the fire escape. So periodically the hospital would come around and say, you can't stay in here, you've got to get out, right? So, so sure. <laughs> Anyway, so we stayed there until Ron developed the uh, Centre for Immunology and eventually the, the uh, lab got bigger and the kinds of, uh, of work uh, became much more complicated. So we started off with uh, evaluation of the screening tests, which weren't licensed at the time that the lab started, certainly. And um, then, then the screening tests themselves became more complex. It became antigen tests and it became the molecular tests. So that was a long time ago. Uh, David was my PhD supervisor as well, and I, I left the group and uh, married an American. We went to the US. Uh, so it's good to come back and, and see some very familiar faces. Um, but in all of that time, Philip uh, joined the group 1987. <laughs> Where has 30 years gone? And uh, he's, uh, he's been there the whole time, and uh, we talked when David passed away about how difficult uh, it, it is for, for all of us, but especially for uh, people who've stayed, who stayed working with him very closely from the very early days. So um, with that, I'll introduce Philip, who, uh, among other things, many other things, is the... Uh, Chief Operating Officer at St. Vincent's Hospital for, uh, um, this is broken, sorry Philip, for Applied Medical Research. So yeah, while we just, <laughs> we'll just fix the pointer while we bring Philip to the, to the, to the uh, podium. So thank you. Thanks Philip. Thanks Alison. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, Dori, Alana, Beck. It's uh, an honour for me today to stand up here and, and talk to you about um, something I know is very dear to David's heart. Uh, and we haven't really talked too much about it, um, uh, which is the lab, and the lab that really underpins all of the great work that David's done in the region, and it's something that I'm very passionate about. So I'm going to, um, hopefully this pointer will work. I'm going to um, give you a little bit of background before I launch in. But um, yeah, a few people look a bit different on there, including me. <laughs> so 32 years ago, almost to the day I was appointed, as Alison said, as a hospital scientist in the newly established HIV reference lab at St Vincent's. It was around the time this picture was taken with David, Basil, Brett. If you didn't recognise Basil, that is Basil. <laughs> I was actually interviewed initially by Alison and then by David. And David leaned across the table. He was in a, in a clinic room which was adjacent to the lab in the hallway. Uh, he was in between patients in a busy outpatients clinic. And he was sitting behind his, you know, rather modest... Uh, timber desk with lovely hospital blue curtains, flanked either side by two very formidable nurses, Esther Schurz and um, uh, Geraldine Dolan. Jerry was here yesterday, it was good to see her. And David leant over and he said, so, in his monotone uh, voice that we all know and, and love, so what do you want to do? <laughs> and I replied to him, and Alison and I were joking about this yesterday, I want to master HIV testing, David, and one day I want to run the lab. And Alison looked at me and said, and like, hey, hang on, that's my job. <laughs> so that was the beginning of what became my career, sur surfing the wave of the emerging new diagnostic technology, which helped us track the unfolding epidemic, better understand how the virus worked, supported world-renowned clinical research, and provided the clinicians at the coalface with the tools they needed to treat the patients. So now I'm going to talk about um, uh, the lab and what we've found and what we've been doing uh, 
particularly using our experience in the region to help uh, our neighbouring countries develop lab infrastructure. And I really like this slide. It tells a thousand, says a thousand words. So we often forget um, here, the pointer's really not going to work for me, is it? No. Anyway, the lab underpins everything we do. Medical research leads on to therapy. The lab underpins clinical research. And really, I think it's important to say, well, why do we want to improve the labs? The labs are often forgot forgotten in, uh, in, in some, in particularly in developing countries. They're a very different, a very different place and a very different environment. So why do we want to do it? And I think the underlying objective there is to create meaningful, confident, comparable test results. And in order to do that, we need to develop a systematic approach to quality management in labs. And in pathology uh, world, we've been doing this for decades and decades. And in, in, in some places, it, it's, not, it's not well embraced. So having a good quality lab that can produce good clinical trial endpoints enables local participation in clinical trials. It, the knock-on effect is that it improves public health surveillance but ultimately it results in better patient care diagnosis, monitoring the therapeutic efficacies and the, therapy and the, the toxicities that we see with therapies. So there are international guidelines that can uh, assist us, and here are just a few. And when we go to, uh, to labs in, in developing uh, or resource-constrained settings or places that really don't have good lab infrastructure at all, we use these guidelines as a... As a I guess a guide. Now, many of the elements that we read in these, are, these are designed for developed rich countries that have good facilities, good infrastructure, good funding, uh, good access to, to uh, tests and reagents. But we can take the relevant elements of here, the principles are the same, and we apply those to uh, the testing process, the process of pr pr producing a good quality result. Now, it's not 30 years, it's 20 years. It feels like 30 years. But we started uh, back in 1997, and we heard from Professor Prapan uh, this morning the story of, of HIVNAT. And I'm going to come back to HIVNAT because HIVNAT was a very important um, part of where I began in regional uh, development of, of lab infrastructure. We then moved, after we developed uh, some capacity in, in HIVNAT, and started clinical trials, we've set up the lab, we've produced a good fundamental quality management framework, we then moved into Cambodia. So Cambodia and NCHADS, the National Institute of Public Health, we were there from 2003, uh, preparing uh, for a, uh, a, a tenofovir prophylaxis study that never happened in, in Phnom Penh, but we started and we invested in lab infrastructure in Cambodia that has been built on year about, year about, uh, and we're now doing, and you can see there in 2006, Cambodia is doing somewhere in the order of uh, the lab that we help build and move and rebuild and renovate and, 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 and upskill. That lab is now doing over 200 viral load tests a day, which is an extraordinary number of, of, of tests. So, we heard about the Bangkok Symposium that, that HIVNAT and uh, uh, that's run every year in Bangkok, and that's been running for more than 20 years. And we, for the last 15 years of that, we've been running a lab symposium. So we invite lab participants, people, scientists, technicians from the region to attend, and we talk about the principles of quality management, topics that might be relevant in, uh, in a developing or a Southeast Asian context. In a hot climate, environments and, and labs, uh, there are different elements that we need to control and consider. Uh, humid and, and hot temperatures uh, create all sorts of problems for getting specimens from point A to point B in a, in a, uh, and logistics of moving samples around uh, in, 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 those, in that sort of climate. We moved into Papua New Guinea. Uh, there was a program that was shared with, funded by AusAid and, um, uh, in, in, in Australia and ASHAM called PASHIP in Papua New Guinea that we developed lab infrastructure and clinical mentoring and later laboratory mentoring uh, 
where we developed a program of support to help local scientists uh, upskill, uh, again, introduce elements of quality management to improve what they were doing. We became a WHO accredited regional reference lab for resistance testing in 2010, uh, and that's enabled us to further our work and assist other, uh, other labs in the region. And you'll see there uh, the Treat Asia. We heard about Treat Asia earlier. Uh, the TARQUIS program. TARQUIS stands for Treat Asia Quality Assurance Scheme. We developed a program of quality assurance where we sent out specimens to labs and we started with a handful of labs that then nearly doubled uh, by the time we'd finished that program. It was, it was, it, it, it was wrapped up because of funding. Uh, but what we demonstrated during that time that all of the participating labs uh, that had difficulty, this is extremely complicated uh, for, for many labs, uh, technology and, and, and testing, and to see the, the evolution and the, and the uh, improvement of those labs in, in key um, performance indicators that, that we set out in that quality assurance program was really quite remarkable. Um, we've heard about uh, March, the, um, the UM2, the University of Medicine 2 in Yangon, Myanmar. I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, we've developed a lab there, uh, announced uh, yesterday by the Vice-Chancellor. Uh, we're very proud of. And more recently, um, uh, we've I've been uh, involved with looking to see whether we can help assist with the, uh, the NIH INA RESPOND project, which is based in Jakarta in Indonesia to support the lab there develop drug resistance uh, testing. So common failures in labs, um, really these are things that we often see when we visit. The testing facilities really, you know, are, are, are limited. They may, you, labs are not what we think of, of labs when in some, in, in some countries. There's a lack of regulatory uh, bodies and accreditation, so pathology accreditation systems in those places. So there is no reason for people to invest in quality management systems that cost money and time. There's often failures in management, so management and clinicians and, and uh, hospital administrators don't recognise the importance of what the lab actually does. Uh, and there are failures around that that, that, that knock on and, and uh, filter down to procurement and a whole range of other things. There's often a lack of training or inadequate training of, of lab staff. There's, a, there's an issue with retention of, of good, uh, skilled laboratory staff. There's often um, private pathology companies that are drawing um, the, the skilled labour out and uh, away from, from some of the, the, the research labs. A real problem is traceability of test records and reports. The documentation, the things that we all do in the clinic and in the lab now in, uh, in, 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 in our countries, uh, really, it, it's very problematic. It's, it's being able to trace who did what, when they did it, where they did it, who validated it, who got the result, where is the result, can we go back in five years' time and look at that result? And these are all really important uh, components if we want to run internationally recognised clinical trials. And as we heard in the, the case of HIVNAT, uh, treatment arrived, effective treatment arrived in HIVNAT on the back of a clinical trial. So we needed to improve uh, and, and, and bring the lab up to, up to speed. Lack of proficiency testing in QC, uh, that's a big one. It's a big one that we, we often see and it's still a problem. Procurement, procurement of, of, of lab supplies is always a problem. Problems with local suppliers are often distributors. They may only be distributing for a short time. There's often the, the sustainability of, of supplies is a real problem. They're often poor quality. They're often procured by people who are not lab people. They're people that are based in public health departments who are buying uh, a, a, a kit or a test kit, an HIV test kit, because it was the cheapest one, for example. So these, pr these are all problems with, uh, that we face in, um, in, in, in some countries. Now, this slide was a courtesy of Professor Papan, and it highlights, this is just before uh, David came back for, in 1996 from the inaugural, inaugural HIVNAT meeting where they decided to form the tripartite um, uh, venture. And, uh, and, and David rang me and said, he spoke to me and said, Philip, 
uh, we've met, we're going to run clinical trials in Thailand, but I need you to go up and sort out the lab. And I don't really have any, this is before we have digital photos, so we didn't really have any great photos of the lab, but this was the lab, the original lab. Um, it was probably a bit before when I first arrived, but you can see we needed to set up HIV-related um, lab testing uh, in, 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 a, in a facility like this. And you can see, um, not being disrespectful, but there are, you know, coffee percolators and uh, coffee cups in the background. So it was a clear de delineation of clean and dirty that we ne needed to, 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 to uh, deal with. But I'm really proud to, to say, and uh, through the efforts of the people on the ground, uh, this is what HIVNAT Clinical Research Lab looks like now. And over the last 20 years, I've visited it virtually every year. Uh, we set an original work plan back in 97. Uh, we came back every year. We met with the, the lab staff and the, uh, the dedicated lab staff that are there that really embraced the elements of the quality management system. And they went on, and a few years ago, they became one of the first labs in Thailand to become accredited by the College of American Pathologists. So this lab is now uh, producing clinical trial quality endpoints, internationally recognised. Uh, this, is, this is really the dream of, and the goal of, of what we want to do with lab capacity building. So very quickly, I'm going to just change tack and talk about what Kirby's been doing in Myanmar. Uh, the March project, as announced by the Vice-Chancellor yesterday, stands for Myanmar Australia Research Collaboration for Health. I'm going to tell you about the, uh, the flowers of the Gangor tree a bit later because it's quite symbolic. So the project in Myanmar has now been going for uh, around five or six years. Uh, Josh Hansen, Dr. Jo Josh Hansen, infectious disease uh, doctor in the middle there has really been central to, to the project. There's a focus on practical management uh, and building local ca uh, capacity of, our re of researchers up there. And as you can see, the academic um, output is impressive. They've done some, um, some fantastic work in malaria, in rabies. We're moving now into, uh, now we have, and clearly we, we never had great lab facilities. Um, the, uh, we're move, moving on to diversify into a range of other things because we've now built some lab facilities. Uh, other, other, other evidence of academic output, there's one doctoral thesis already completed, there's three in progress, one master's thesis completed and two in progress, and clearly we we're supporting some of the local departmental research as well. So when I arrived in only probably about 12 months ago, the labs looked like this. They were pretty much teaching uh, university labs. They were timber, the bench surfaces were, were, were bad. Clearly there were issues with um, uh, with cross-contamination and really not suitable for the sort of work that we wanted to do. We were there for three days. Uh, we were there with a parliamentary delegation and Bill was there uh, and we walked through and I, th I think the first time we walked through some of those labs, Bill was there, Tony was there, a few of us were there and we walked through and, um, and you know, we, we met that night for dinner and David said, so, you know, what do you think, Philip? Do you think you can do what you did in... Um, in, in HIVNAT, do you think, you know, you want to, and I said, David, this is ground zero. We really, we really have to um, think about this. And so that night I said, yeah, I think this, is, this could be really fun and I think there's all the hallmarks here of, of what HIVNAT has done and we can, we can really try and do it again. And that night I stayed back with the lab staff, with the whiteboard here and uh, we took uh, there was a room that was vacant uh, upstairs from, from these labs and uh, we sat down and we sat there and drew the, f the footprint of the lab and I said, well, you know, let's think about workflow, let's think about what we want to do, these are the tests we want to do, we want to introduce some molecular biology, we need to think about clean and dirty and pre and post amplification and we have to think about where the waste is going to go and the security and the temperature in here and the and the power and the water and all this stuff that we just take for granted, uh, we needed to map this out. And we set, took the whiteboard and I said, okay, um, on, the, on the second night we said, all right, um, are there, do, you, do you guys know any uh, companies that work in Yangon that build labs? 
And they, uh, they said, yeah, there's a couple, and there's one who's particularly good. And uh, I said, all right, I want you to bring them here in the morning. We've got to go to the airport in the afternoon. You bring them here in the morning, we'll talk to them. So we met with both companies. One of them uh, was there. David came in late, and you know, I think David was a bit over it and bored, and he was playing on his iPad. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but we sat down, and the, the, the company that we said, all right, and he produced some really neat stuff and had some good ideas. And I said, all right, we have to leave now, but I want you to measure up the lab this is the design, I want you to come back to me. And so then the emails started to come and go and it all started to unfold. So we came back to Sydney and with the help of a, an institute of global development and University of, of Sydney, uh, University of, of uh, New South Wales initiative, it's an international global development program to develop projects in the region. Uh, we put in a submission for a grant, we bought all this equipment um, and uh, there's an element in there to bring some research, uh, bring some of the lab staff out to do some training in our lab in Sydney. And so this really was the, was the next step. So the plans came in for the lab, and I think Tony showed these pictures earlier, but that's what the lab looked like before. There were, it was a, a pretty much a, a raw concrete floor. Those windows there are opening naturally to the, to, the, to the outside. It was hot, it was humid, there was no air conditioning. Um, it was, the, the furniture was timber and, and really not appropriate. And in a short time, those plans came back uh, and we'd, um, we were able, with a, with a small investment, to turn the, the lab around, and that's what it looks like now. But now it's actually got a, a lot more equipment and some staff in there. So we've since moved on. Um, in uh, in uh, a few months ago, we were there uh, the equipment, we've put in a, uh, a point of care molecular testing platform, which is really just perfect technology for this kind of a place, easy to use. And we're now doing um, multiplex PCR testing for uh, encephalitis and meningitis. The first time ever in Myanmar, and we're now in a position where we're characterising the prevalence of various, um, an incidence of, of, of various uh, um, neurological diseases as one of the projects. So the future, we saw this photo before, there's David planting the gangor tree, and then you can see there, and in, this is Professor Mama Chi, she's the Professor of Medicine at the Insane General Hospital, which is the bigger hospital we're collaborating with, and you can see this is the same tree, uh, pretty much uh, a year later, being it's, it's in flower. The flowers come out in March, which is interesting, and it's also the month that David passed away. So uh, that was a, a, um, that's a, quite a nice tribute. So the flowers represent the flowers of the Gangor tree. The tree represents growth and collaboration. Uh, and I think it's there and it will, it'll, it's grow, clearly growing very happily. So in conclusion, <laughs> so in conclusion, and, and Dr. Prapan, Dr. Prapan talked about the, uh, the HIVNAT retreat, and this is one such HIVNAT retreat where the, all of the different faculties of HIVNAT have a show and a competition, and, and these are the, the lovely lab staff, um, and there's David and Sean um, in a relaxed sort of environment. So David's amazing vision, his unwavering support and encouragement led me uh, to do what I'm doing now. I'm very proud of that. And I have to say, you know, thank you, David, and what a legacy. Thank you. Thank you.